Of course, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, so we cannot carry anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Those who want to be rich, however, fall into temptation and become ensnared by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. By craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made the good confession before many witnesses. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you. Lord, I do thank you for the freedom that we have in this country to worship you. I thank you for your word, which is truth. I thank you for the availability that we have of that. Father, so many times, especially here, we take those things for granted. You have given us so much. We are truly rich. Help us to pursue your riches, to build up treasures in heaven, not treasures here on earth. To think of others over ourselves, Lord, and to think clearly of the task that has been given us, what we've been commissioned and empowered to do to be a light to this world. We just thank you and praise you for the time that we can come together, Lord. Equip us for when we're out there in the world and help us just not take this salvation lightly, but to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So that's the right one. So you can lay them up here. So if you find that I tell you something wrong, tell me. Because last week, Mark corrected me and Sherry corrected me. I was trying to clear up an error of this and saying that it wasn't from one uh, group of people, it was from another, and I told you the wrong one. <laughs> this is from the Seventh-day Adventist is who it's from. And that sheds a little different light onto it, but we'll, we'll talk about that when you want to talk about it. But if you catch me in anything in Scripture, you be sure to tell me. Because she will, but that's not the point. We're here to make sure that we know the truth. There are plenty of Gospels out there in this world, and especially in this country, that are twisted Gospels, that are half-truths, that are watered-down truths, and you are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He said, if you will come after me, if you will choose me. Scripture says, if you profess the Lord, believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not your buddy, not your friend, not anything else, not a casual acquaintance, but the love of your life, that you love God more than you love anything else. And we've been talking about this great commandment and how that applies to our life because basically Jesus said... This is what sums up all of the, the scriptures, the law, the prophet, everything else, is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That means that if you love God, if you're living a holy life, if you think of Him more than you think of oxygen, and you thank Him for that and everything else, that you can't help but be a light to this world. You can't help but love others as Christ loved you. That's the essence of being a Christian, being like Christ, a little Christ. It's the essence of being the body of Christ and being the church. If you've got this book, we are studying it. I'll do it quickly so we don't talk about the particulars. We're studying this book, and it is very, very watered down, and it's, it, it bothers me. So I want to teach you the truth. So if you're reading that book outside of our study in Sunday school, talk to me about it. 
this, this book was recommended to us, and it's what the Free Methodists are wanting to do this year is concentrate on the Great Command, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But there's not a help book that's going to tell you how to do it. This book is going to tell you how to do it with fasting, with prayer, with seeking God with all of your heart, all of your mind, everything in your being, to know that God wants to be known by you. And He's not far from you. This Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Everything in the Bible is true. And we need to study it. And you read from 1 Timothy today. That's part of what our WANA program is, is to study to be an approved workman before God that you might not be ashamed on the day that Jesus Christ returns. Jesus Christ came just as God said He would, the Messiah, the Chosen One, the Holy One of God that would save their people from their sins. And He will return again to claim each and every one who is His. And He will also separate the goats from the sheep. You can be in the same pasture, you can look like a sheep, but Jesus knows whether you are His sheep or not. And if you are His sheep, then you hear His voice and you follow His voice. And you will not follow someone else's voice. Even if that voice comes from me or some other religious source, we go back to John 10.10 10, where Jesus says, and that's where our little card started with, what it was John 10.10, 10, that Jesus has come to give you life. And not just life, but that you would have it abundantly. And he said also there that he was the gate for the sheep and that he was the, uh, the gate for the sheep and that he was the great good shepherd. He also said in that scripture that the others, and we tend to think of that as being a Satan, are those who steal, kill, and destroy. But he's talking about the religious leaders of that day because of their hypocrisy. They were teaching other gospels. Last, last year we read through the New Testament and you saw that most of those letters that are written to the different churches are to warn them about other gospels that are being presented. Because we fight a spiritual battle waging for your soul and the soul of others. And if Satan can't have your soul, he certainly wants to water you down where you're not effective in the kingdom. But the gospels are written continually talk about and Jesus continually talks about to repent because the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. And if you are part of it, if you are God's child, then you are called to live a holy life that loves God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength and loves others as much as you love yourselves. That puts a totally different perspective on what it is to live in the United States. <laughs> Because most people think about what they're going to live and do for themselves. We have freedom. And I just those words just echo that are all throughout the Bible. We have freedom to do whatever we want. That means you have freedom to give up this life also to live for Jesus Christ. To draw others into the kingdom. To think of others more than yourself. To even lay down your life being a witness. The word means martyr that you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because you know it is the power that brings about salvation. And you not only are God's child, but you have resurrecting power, the same power that, that was there in creation that hovered over the waters and the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead because Jesus tore that veil and now you're a royal holy priesthood with God's Holy Spirit living inside of you. Wow! Are you living like that? So I had Sherry bring these books, is what she did. I want everybody to get one in a pamphlet because this is basically the foundations of what free Methodists believe. And everybody should know that, to know what we believe. So when somebody does ask, because if you're out there in the world and the opportunity does come around where your light has shined and people say, hey, why do you believe this way? Why are you different? And you tell them about your Jesus, because there's so many <coughs> twisted, distorted views out there of who Jesus was, whether he was just a good philosopher, or, you know, a great teacher, he is God. One of the things that this book keeps saying is, Jesus had it all figured out. No, Jesus is the one who figures everything out because he already knows everything. 
and it says that Jesus is a genius in the things he says. No, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. He's not a good guy. He's not a great philosopher. He is God made flesh and dwelling among us. And he offers you eternal life if you will choose to follow him. The basics that you'll find in here that you need to know are the basics that I'm sure most of us already believe because I know most of you in what you believe. We talk about it. It doesn't go into end times and things like that because that's not important. As Pauly said, it is important. Don't get me wrong on saying that. Let me, so I don't, you don't come back later and chastise me. Our mission, though, is to live like Christ in this world. We know that he'll come again. We don't know the answers of how and when and everything else. And we can look at all these things and look at end times and say, surely times are closer. But all of the disciples thought Jesus would return before their death, period. And they lived their life as as it was not their own with the urgency that they had to get out there and get the message. And if they took the message out there without living it, then it was just hypocrisy. But if they lived it, then they had the urgency to tell people because Jesus Christ would be returning soon. Nothing has changed. You have been equipped and empowered and commissioned to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, and there is urgency in your lifetime to do that. And the only thing you can't do with your freedom and your money and everything else that you have is add one second to your life. You can think that you can... Make yourself more healthy and everything else, but there is nothing that you can do whatsoever. And we will get to that rich man who built bigger barns soon. We're not there yet, but we'll get to that sermon this year. Because he thought he had all the time in the world, but we have no idea the time that we have. And every second that we have is God's grace to us to live a life thanking him for creating us and redeeming us through the blood of his precious son. If you didn't get one of these two, this is 10 reflections of uh, going into Easter from the daily bread. And I trust the daily bread is a good source too. So I think it'd be a good thing to read. Easter's coming up three Sundays from today if I have that right on my calendar, right? Two weeks is uh, uh, Palm Sunday. Three weeks is Easter. So we're going to continue today about loving Jesus and loving our neighbors. I said we would last week. And that question of who is my neighbor, and that's pretty clear. We don't need to go down that road. Who is my neighbor? Anyone, even my enemy. That's why the Samaritan was brought into the story, because he was a kinsman of uh, the Judean, but he was an enemy also. And he was an enemy because of his his, uh, distorted views of, of what God was. But he was plainly an enemy because... I like people that like me, and I don't want to go out of my way. You understand? I know you understand. (laughs) Because it's easy to love and like some people. And it's easy to want to not love, I didn't use the other word, other people. But we're called to love even our enemies because why? Because we were all enemies of Jesus when he laid down his life on this cross for us. No one was his friend. And it's okay, it's okay the past things you've done. Peter denied Jesus Christ three times. He did it progressively worse. But Jesus forgave him. He offers forgiveness to each and every one of you, no matter what you've done, no matter what you will do. But put your faith and trust in him that he is Lord of all and live like that. And how did Jesus tell Peter that he was restored? If you love me, what? Feed my sheep. Not believe that I am, not live a life of holiness, but that life of holiness that you choose to live, loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, will make you be a light to others. You will live for others and you will feed them. Not just physically, but eternal food. The Greek word for neighbor is plaision. It's used 17 times in the New Testament. One time is just translated as near, 16 more times it's translated as neighbor. And we looked at some of those. Most every time it's not just, hey, that's my neighbor. It's an application that is, let's say, very serious. Because there's a question asked, 
what must I do to inherit eternal life from a religious leader or religious hypocrite, depending on whether they repented or not? There is a question that says, what is the greatest commandment? And both of those, an both of those times we get an answer to love your neighbor. And who is my neighbor? Everyone. Even that one that's hard to love. We looked at some of the times that the uh, letters to the churches had neighbor written in it. Romans 13 verse 9 says, The commandments are, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Referring back to Leviticus 19. And love does no harm to their neighbor. Okay, so now we've got the action. I'm supposed to love my neighbor, whoever that is, and it's all summed up in everything that I read, and love does no harm to my neighbor. So I have to get rid of that anger and that hatred. I have, I'm not even let, supposed to let the sun go down on it. Okay, and I need to love them by doing nothing that is bad, but instead doing things that are good. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Then Paul writes again in Romans 15, verse 1, We who are strong ought to bear the, way, the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. You see the progression here. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good. This is why we've been given the hope, the peace, and the joy that comes from Jesus Christ. To please our neighbor for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself. We have that preposition tying it all together. Why? Because Jesus gave up everything not to please himself, not to consider equality with God something to be used for his advantage, but to suffer and die for you. To not have the necessities and the pleasures of life. Because he wants you to have the pleasures of eternal life. Not just eternal life, but communion with God. Because God wants to be known by you and be in a relationship with you. To love you. In Ephesians, Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.23, To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehoods and speak truthfully to your neighbor about physical things and about spiritual things, and you need to study the truth of God so that you can rightly handle it, so that you won't be ashamed on that day, and so that you won't be leading people astray, that you'll be giving and leading people into true life, abundant life that they can have in Jesus Christ. And that means you can't just preach it, you've got to live it, correct? And James, we read in James 2, starting in verse 8, if you really keep the royal law that is found in scriptures, which he names, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, so you can't live the law but still say, well, that person, you can't do that. That's called hypocrisy. You're wearing a mask. You're acting as a, you're playing out an actor on a stage. You're not genuine. Jesus knows your heart. He knows if you truly believe with all of your heart and you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, soul, and your strength. And he knows if you truly love your neighbor or you show favorites to some versus the other. Get rid of all of that. Think about the scripture that, that Paul wrote to Timothy um, that Teresa read this morning. And that part in James goes on to talk about the true freedom that you have. The freedom that you have to live a life as Christ lived or to continue to live a life based on your own needs and desires. The choice is yours. But Jesus came to bring you not only life, but abundant life. Chasing after created things will never bring you pleasure, will never bring you peace. Chasing after God because He chased after you so much that He gave His one and only Son, 
that will bring you abundant life. That will bring you joy that you've never experienced, peace that you'll never experience. And guess what? It will be leading other people along the way to find that peace and happiness too. And then we looked at Mark chapter 12 when there was a religious leader there that came up and said, what is the uh, greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the most important one is hear this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this statement that he's saying here is saying, listen up, I'm putting all this together. You know all the traditions that, that we do, all the feasts and everything else that you that hold. All of this comes together here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And Jesus puts the two into one saying that you can't have one without the other, which is the Ten Commandments. If you love God, you will love your neighbor as it progresses down. If you covet the things in, in the Tenth Commandment, you'll never love the Lord your God because you're putting other things before God created things that you desire to have. You don't trust God enough to supply you with them and you put more emphasis on those things. How will you live your life when those things that you spend your time and your effort and your passion on are all taken from you? Will you still love the Lord? Will you still thank the Lord? The disciples gave up everything to follow Jesus, including their life. The church did that in the early example. As we first start reading about the church, we read that some of them sold all of their possessions so that they could provide for others. The reason they sold their possessions is because they did not consider them their own. They considered them a gift from God that could be used to help others instead of to just line their own pockets. Maybe they heard that sermon about the rich ruler who built bigger barns. Maybe they really let it sink in instead of just hearing it with their ears and letting it go back out. That passage in Mark 12 ends in verse 34. When Jesus saw that the, the leader answered correctly because he told him back uh, that Jesus answered correctly and that he was wise, and he even added that to love your neighbor as yourself in verse 33 is more important than all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. All of the things that you were required to do by the law, all the things that showed you were a holy people, he said that loving your neighbor was even more important than those. He understood all this, but would he do it? So Jesus answered him in verse 34, and he said, You're not far from the kingdom of God. So I ask you today, how far are you from the kingdom of God? That's what Jesus preached about. He said, repent, change your way of thinking so that it changes your heart and changes your actions because the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus came to teach you about it, to expound upon the law so that you would realize that anger in your heart could be considered murder. He came to give you freedom. He came to die for your sins so that the penalty of your sins would be forgiven. He took God's wrath upon himself and so that Satan would not have power over you. You don't have to sin. You have the power inside of you to transform you into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ if you'll just submit to the power of the Holy Spirit. So are you far from the kingdom of God or are you living like a true child of the kingdom of God? Luke chapter 10 is where we're going today. We're going to look at what was said there when Jesus talked about the greatest commandment. A disciple is one who lets their master train them so that they can be like their master. A disciple is one that Jesus called his disciples, his, those that chose to follow after him. You won't see Jesus using the word Christian. He calls them disciples. He calls them brothers. A disciple is, is, the statement's clear, that you know that this is the master that you're going to follow and you will f pattern your life after following him so you can be like him and you can teach others. That is your goal, that is your mission for your life, is to be a disciple of whoever that you're following. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? 
If you are, we talked a few weeks ago that Jesus said when he said, come and follow after me, which is implied that you forsake everything else, that he would make you into a fisher of men. Whatever you were before, whatever your occupation was before, and there were true physical fishermen, there, were other, there was a tax collector, there was a zealot, and so forth. He would turn them all into fishers of men. That is your goal, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. To tell the truth of the kingdom so that they in turn can enter the kingdom and live for the kingdom until Jesus Christ returns. You have to get rid of your old ways of thinking. You have to leave those things behind. You can't have any other gods before Him. You have to love the Lord your God with everything, and you have to love your neighbor as yourself, which is impossible for you and I to do, but totally possible, a reality for you, if you let God do it through you. You can never save yourself. You can never get to God. You can never be like Jesus unless you let God Himself give you new birth and then transform you into His likeness. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Do you understand what the great commandment is, what the great commission is? Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Your Bible may say 70. That's fine and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place that he was able to visit. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful. So the first words that we have there in red, the first words from Jesus are, the harvest is plentiful. If you choose to follow after Jesus, choose to be his disciple, he will make you into a fisher of men, and then when he sends you out, here are your instructions. The harvest is plentiful. Pretty simple. Your goal is to be like Jesus, to draw people into the kingdom, and there is an abundance of fish out there to catch. You don't have to do the catching either. You simply be, need to be willing to fish. Just like Peter, again, needed to be willing to step out on the water to be able to walk on water, didn't he? And when he took his eyes off Jesus, he sank. But he's the only one in that boat that got out and walked on water, isn't he? And I bet you next time that opportunity was given to him, he'd fix his eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of his faith, so that he could be like Jesus. Not just by being able to walk on water, but to be a fisher of men, to build up true riches in the kingdom of heaven, to present the truth that will save not only our family and our friends, but even our enemies. Wow. Wow. So G Jesus sends out, out these 72 to work for the kingdom. Wouldn't you think there's more than 72 by now? You know, this is two, two and a half years into Jesus' ministry. He's been preaching all over to a country who has done all of the, these keeping of these laws, looking for the Messiah to come. Huge crowds are there, thousands of people. Let's see, he fed 4,000 men plus women and children. He fed 5,000 uh, men plus women and children. But what did the people want, the masses want? They wanted the good things that could be offered them. They wanted freedom, but they wanted freedom from the oppression of the Roman Empire that was there. For what? So they could do their own thing again. Not so that they could be a holy people and live for God. We've got their history that shows they didn't do that. We can't do that unless we let God transform us. We will fall right back into the stiff-necked pattern of the children of Israel. You would think by now that there would be hundreds following Jesus. But let's see, their name, 70 or 72 plus 12. <laughs> We've got less than 100 people willing to give up their life to follow after Jesus. Now, here's the difference. They saw the fishes and loaves. They saw the other mighty miracles by the finger of God. And still there were less than 100 people saying, I'm willing to give up my life. I'll take it if I can take it some other way, but I don't want this gift of eternal life if it's going to cost me something big. Is it? God's gift to you worth everything? 
What are you going to say to Jesus on that day when you don't rightly handle the word of truth? When you don't obey the great commandment? When you don't obey the great commission? Well, I obeyed this. Well, Scripture's clear. If you fall on one instant of the law, you're guilty of all the law. Oh, yes, you're saved by grace, not by works of righteousness, which you've done, but by grace, by faith in Jesus Christ alone. But as James said, if you do believe, then you'll prove it by the works that you do. That if you don't have the works, then your faith is dead. Is your faith proving that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength? And is it shown in how you love others and you're a light to them in this world? They, sent, they were sent out as fishers of men to announce the coming of the Messiah. Well, guess what? We go, we're sent out to announce that. And in Easter, in a little bit, we also say that, you know, this killed him. Didn't kill him. <laughs> he laid down his life. But he took it up again. He rose from the dead, giving us a hope that these 72 did not know anything about. We've, we've got all the truth of the Word of God, the mighty miracles that Jesus did, including resurrecting power that should transform us and we should not be able to keep silent about. Because God loves us so much that He sent Jesus and Jesus is alive today and He will return. Death can't keep us in the grave. It has no sting for us because we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. How can I not change the way that we live? And you're sent just the same as these 72 are. Will you obey your master and Lord, your rabbi, your teacher, your king? Will you obey him and pledge your allegiance to him or is your allegiance to some other king? Do you make excuses? Jesus will return and you will be accountable to him for the life that you have lived for Him or not. Whether you've been a good steward of that. It is imperative that you carry out this great commission, this great command. The harvest is plentiful. Nothing's changed. There's more people in this world than there was, were then in the days of Jesus. The harvest is even greater. You have every opportunity in this country to live for your own freedom or to live for the freedom that's in Jesus Christ. The harvest is plentiful. Oh, let's read on though. But the workers are few. There's that big but. The total opposite. The harvest is so plentiful, so great, and you've been called to be a part of it. It is your commission. You've been empowered to do it. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ as though God was making His reconciliation to men through you. But the workers are few. So then He told them to pray. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into His harvest. I wonder what, sometimes if we're not serious enough in our prayers. If that's why the harvest is not as great. Right here's your bib biblical precedent. If you're worried about your family and friends, are you on your knees praying about them? And then are you living your life to show them that your faith is real or are you living your life to show them that your faith is shallow? And what's shallow faith? Is it real or not real? Do you get through by the skin of your teeth? Or do you, when you meet Jesus face to face, hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. It's all about how you lived your life based on the faith that you proclaim that you have. <clears throat> if you read on, Jesus denounces the cities where the proof that He gave them came. You know, and he's not, <laughs> he's not pleasant here with what He says. Verse 13, Woe to you, Chorazan! Woe to you, Bethsaida! Woe is... There's not anything much more terrible than that. Woe! This is, this is what your fate is going to be. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, wicked cities, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the, day that, uh, at the judgment than for you. 
And for you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to heaven? Here's your answer. No. You've seen the mighty miracles of God, but you're, you know that Jesus is a prophet, a man of God. No one could perform these mighty miracles except they were from God, but you're not willing to give up your life to follow God. Will you be lifted up to heaven? No. You will be brought down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me will you follow after King Jesus. Because if you reject him, you reject the one who sent him, God Almighty. The one that you should fear that has the authority and the power to throw you into hell for all eternity. The disciples go on their mission, they come back, they follow the instructions, and they joyfully return to Jesus, the one that commissioned them, empowered them, and the one that sent them. The same one that has commissioned you and empowered you and sent you. You might not be in a foreign mission field, but you are in a workplace, you are in a neighborhood, you are in a family, you're in other clubs and, and things as well. You are to be a light for Jesus Christ in this world. They come back with great news of great joy. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They went out and cast out demons in the name of Jesus Christ. Now don't take just what this side of the story is. They cast out demons. On this side of the story is the people who had demons that were cast out from. They had no more oppression from these things that had controls on their life anymore. They heard the truth and the truth set them free because these people were willing to go and know that they had power inside of them to cast out demons. But see, their focus was on the wrong thing again. Their focus was on, we had power to do this, not on the compassion for the neighbor on the other side of the story. The neighbor that might just choose to follow after Jesus. And Jesus goes on and tells them not only are they misfocused there, but they're truly misfocused on what their true joy should be. They should love their neighbor as themselves, but they should also rejoice because their names are written in heaven because they've chose to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. And that's what drives them to love their neighbor. So then Jesus tells this little story, or however you want to think about it, he says in verse 18, So he saw, told them, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Challenge you to go read some commentaries because they're all over the place on what this means. And none of us know. But I can tell you truth behind this and it's going to be truth behind this because I'll base it off of other biblical doctrine. I'll tell you th three things about what Jesus meant here and he probably meant a lot more. Satan fell from heaven because he rejected God. Because of his pride, he rebelled against God. We rebelled against God. We had one command, don't eat from this tree. I know that was Adam and Eve, not us. <laughs> okay, examine your own life and tell me how many times you have rebelled from God, even as a Christian, and said, I know I should do this, but I'm doing this. Well, let's choose that person that we've decided to hate then instead of love. There you go. You're all, we're all guilty. <laughs> we are guilty of our own pride over following God. And that will be to our fall and destruction. Repent. If demons submitted and were cast out by the disciples, that ought to tell you too that the commander of them has no power over you. Scripture tells you to tell Satan to flee from you. You belong to Jesus Christ. The devil can't do anything to you. You want to debate that more? We'll debate it. I'd love to debate that one. He has no power in your life. But you listen to those little lies and say, I'm not ready to go do this, Lord, yet because of this. I'm not empowered because I don't have this gift. Pray for that gift. You might just get it. What good father doesn't give gifts to his children, good gifts to his children? How much more is your heavenly father going to give to you the Holy Spirit 
if you ask Him. If your burden in your heart is on loving God with all your mind, soul, body, and strength, and your burden is on saving your neighbor, then He just might give you more of the Spirit to do that job. Because the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Pray that He will send out workers into the harvest, including myself. Jesus commissioned, empowered them, and sent them to go and gather. Not scatter, but gather. Advancing God's kingdom in this world. Not my will be done, but His will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Advancing the kingdom of God. In verse 19 it says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. Right there Jesus says it. But so many times we won't go and fish because of our fears. So the second thing that Jesus meant here that I'm going to say is you don't, shouldn't have any fears. Jesus saw Satan falling from heaven. Whether that was the past or the present, when you go out and are obedient to Jesus Christ, Satan is falling from his kingdom. You are a part of it, even as though you were ambassadors doing God's work through you. You are Christ's ambassadors to the world, which means you have to live a holy, set-apart life. You have to know your agenda, and you have to live that agenda. Jesus will change you into fishers of men, transform you. So can you see the bigger picture? Verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Wow. If my name is written in heaven, nothing can harm me. I've, I see Satan falling from his kingdom. All of his power and authority were ripped from him when Jesus went to the cross. Jesus even said in John 12 that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it can't produce a harvest. He was talking about himself, but he was also talking about his disciples. Unless you're willing to die to yourself, to take up the cross of suffering and shame for Jesus, then you won't follow after him. You won't be the fisher of men. You won't be gathering in the harvest like God has intended for you to be. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And then Jesus prays by the power of the Holy Spirit, verse 21. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. Don't rely on your mind. Rely on the Spirit that transforms your mind. Not by your own power, but the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ coming back to life and teaching us that we, and offering us and teaching us that we are resurrected children. We have eternal life. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Verse 23, Then Jesus turned to His disciples privately, those who truly listened and obeyed. He said, Blessed are the eyes that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. The third thing that Jesus meant when He said, I saw Satan falling from heaven. He said, Satan doesn't know it, but you know it. The victory's already won. You are victorious in Jesus Christ. Now I can give you so many more things that Jesus meant by saying this, but He was telling His disciples, I saw Satan himself the great deceiver, much greater than the demons out there that you were casting out. I saw him fall from heaven. And then I'm telling you this when you were obedient and went out. There's got to be a direct correlation there. 
He's telling them this to inspire them. That nothing can hurt them. Nothing can harm them. They have great and mighty power, the power of God residing in them to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, so greater things they can do than Jesus even did when He was here in His earthly ministry. That's the power that you and I have, and collectively as a church, it's even greater. Are we living that? Do you realize the greatness that you've been given, the great command, the great commission, the great power that's residing in you? And are you living it? So then Luke is writing this orderly account, right? Because that's how it starts out in Luke, that he's writing a most, or, uh, most orderly account to Theopolis. And in verse 25 it says, One day an expert in the law stood up to test him, just like we had in Mark. We have religion testing Jesus through a religious person, of course. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, and he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What's the greatest command? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Two huge questions. I told you the neighbor was tied to these huge theological questions. So are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you following after Him? Are you letting Jesus turn you into a fisher of men? Are you gathering instead of scattering? How will you answer Jesus that day? Do you know for sure that you'll inherit the kingdom of life, of eternal life? The expert knew all of the law backwards and forwards. He's not just a person who reads the law. He's an expert in doing it. He's your expert uh, attorney in these matters that you would go seek because he's going to win this case. <laughs> not this case. Okay? If you know the law, but you don't do it, what are you? A law breaker. Well, you can say that you have faith in Jesus Christ, and that's great. But if you're still breaking the law, as I'm not your judge, just using these terms again, as a judge, I would find it hard that you know what the law really is because you're not obeying it. But Jesus knows your heart. He knows if you are or not. Give Him all of your heart. All of your mind so other things don't distort it. All of your soul so it is His. It doesn't belong to another master. All of your body. Everything that you do with it. That expert in the law asked him this question because he wanted to justify himself. Jesus said to him, threw the question back to him, verse 26, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Okay, very simple. If I know the law, I know how I read it. I should do it. Hear, O hear, O Israel, love the Lord your God. I should obey the law. It's pretty simple. Even childlike faith, which Jesus just said before, would understand that. Son... You're not supposed to eat cookies out of the cookie jar. Yes, Daddy, I know it. Then when he goes and eats the cookies out of the cookie jar, he knows he did wrong. But he did what he wanted to do. He knew it was wrong. If you obey one letter of the law, you know that it's wrong. You're dis... You're, did I say the wrong thing? Thank you. You know that you're disobeying the law and you should be punished. But because God loves you so much, He's given you mercy and grace. Why would you take that so lightly? Wouldn't you want to give up everything for your Lord and your King and follow after Him? This is the man's uh, answer. He answered and said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We hear it over and over again. He answered correctly. Jesus acknowledged that. Verse 28, you have answered correctly. But then you have Jesus' words that follow that. There's no but here, but you could put one there if you want to. It all depends on what the man's response was. Do this and you will live. 
Don't just have head knowledge. Apply it to your heart. Let it apply to your actions. If you do that, you will live. But the man wanted to justify himself still, and he said, Who is my neighbor? There we go. My place see on. So Jesus told him the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, we don't know if the religious leader took this to heart. We don't know the answers to that. And we can look at the, the parable, which I've talked about and talked about. But you had two religious people in this parable that knew what they were supposed to do and didn't. And then you had the bad guy in the story because he's my enemy. I, I, I'm automatically going to think of him in the ba as the bad guy, even though I shouldn't because we're all enemies. He did the right thing. So it should dumb and confound me that him being a heathen would do the right thing when I fail to do the right thing because of my hypocrisy, because of my not repenting and changing my way of thinking, my not fearing God more than I feared men and what they would say to, say to me for doing this, what it would cost me. There's so many variables you can put into the story yourself. But Jesus goes on to ask him, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And the man answered in verse 37, the one who showed him mercy. There's your answer. What is mercy? Giving somebody something they don't deserve. Why? Because I have compassion and pity on them. Why? Because as a Christian, as a law abider, I should know that God has compassion and pity on me, wretched as I am. And I deserve the complete opposite of the love and the mercy and the grace that He has shown me. So I am going to live my life showing others that love and mercy and grace that He has shown me. I understand the law. And because of Jesus Christ empowering me and teaching me and living it for me, I have the ability to live the law. To love the Lord my God with everything and then not, I can't be able to help but to love my neighbor as much as I love myself, even to the point of loving them as much as Christ loved me and gave himself for me. And what was Jesus' answer? Go and do likewise. Jesus tells us that we cannot hear his words and not obey his words. That he has set the standard What's the greatest of all the commandments that sums up everything? To love the Lord your God with everything and love your neighbor. What must I do to inherit eternal life? To love the Lord your God with everything and to love your neighbor. Are you and I doing that? This religious man knew the right answers just as the other religious man knew the right answers. But the question lies on would it change his way of thinking so it changed his actions? Or would he just continue on down the road of life as a religious hypocrite, confident that he would have eternal life, confident that he knew the law and the great command, but not putting them into action? And what would he say to Jesus Christ on the day that he met Jesus face to face? When he knew the truth, he knew that he should be a fisher of men. He saw the mighty miracles of God. Later he sees the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He knows that the harvest is great, but the workers are few. What will he say to Jesus when Jesus says, What did you do with your life for me? I did everything with my life for you. Father in heaven, help us to be fishers of men. Lord, we do pray for the harvest today. Lord, it is so great. And in these times, Lord, of uncertainty and, and, and a Samaritan in the form of, of government providing for people rather than the church and everything else, people don't see you as much as they should. They don't think they need you. They've got government. They've got the, the things in their life that bring them comfort and everything else. But do they really bring them comfort and peace that Jesus would bring them? We know the truth of that. 
Help us to be fishers of men. Help us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Help us to be people that bring true life because we bring people into the fold rather than scatter people. That we realize that Jesus is not only the gate, but He is the good shepherd and that we serve Him and we let Him shepherd us as we shepherd others. Help us not to take our salvation lightly, but to work it out with fear and trembling. And Lord, we do pray for the harvest, not only for our enemies, but Lord, we pray with passion for our families. I don't think there's anyone here that doesn't have people in their families that, that are a burden on their heart that they become to know Jesus. Lord, help us to get serious about our prayers and serious about our actions. Let us have no other gods before you, but to serve you and love you with all that we have because Jesus Christ gave all for us. As we approach Easter, Lord, help us to spend time in reflection, whether it being fasting or prayer or whatever it may be, but just to contemplate and think about the love that you gave us, which is the exact opposite of what we deserved, and that that love was so gracious in the fact that we could be called children of God. Let us rejoice, truly rejoice, that our names are written in heaven. We thank you and praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.